Welcome back to Huchos. Today on Huchos, I'm going to take you on a walk around the garden, showing you what's new, what I'm working on at the moment, some updates on previous builds, and some of the problems I've been having, as well as some of the successes. So let's get started. So first things first, the greenhouse. So as we walk in the greenhouse, you can see I've got tomato plants, on our wicking rain gutter grow systems. So I've actually had a spider mite infestation, a russet mite infestation on some of my tomatoes. Now, these tomato plants are all looking relatively healthy. So that's because I've actually had to remove a bunch of tomato plants because the russet mite infestations were so bad that the plants were basically unrecoverable. The way that I've dealt with this will be tackled in a full video where I've changed direction with this system build from describing how to build the system because there will be other videos that explain that and I'm moving towards a how to deal with a spider mite infestation video. The cliff notes here are I've actually used a combination of mancozeb, sulfur and pyrethrums to eliminate the initial infestation, or at least to reduce the numbers of spider mites, and then added in Californicus predatory mites to mop up the rest. And I'm seeing good results so far. However, I only recently added in Californicus mites. As you can see, this dusting here is actually the media that the Californicus came within. Hopefully those mites are right now mopping up the infestations that are in the media and on the plants that were left that weren't too damaged. As you can see with this tomato that is quite a bit larger than my other tomato plants. This is the kind of damage that they were doing. Now there aren't any live mites left on these dead leaves and I will be removing them very soon but this is the damage that was happening really right at the crown of the plant. And it was causing the plants to be malformed and just not productive at all. But that will be a future video and I'll cover the complete treatment of the spider mites in that video. The NFT is doing fantastically. I added all of these plants in yesterday actually. All I'm using here is uh, the cotton wool method of propagation and I'm actually probably going to start really perfecting this method of propagation. I want to start treating the cotton wool so that I'm not getting so many algal blooms and other microbial activity within the cotton because I don't think the cotton's sterile enough when I'm adding the seeds in. I think I'm going to start treating it with H2O2 to try and eliminate any microbes from that cotton because the cotton, it is very susceptible to having those microbial bloomings, I guess, in comparison to say cocoa, which has antifungal and antimicrobial properties baked into the actual media. Even without such treatments, I think this is a fantastic method. On this side of the NFT, I've got some really nice cos coming through. One thing I want to show you that I've been doing lately that I'm quite excited about, um, I'm sure this is like not news to soil gardeners at all, but I have never grown spring onion in an NFT or at all. And this is quite exciting for me. What I've started doing to the spring onion, when I'm harvesting it, rather than harvesting the whole thing, I'm cutting the tops off it. And as you can see here, the spring onion starts to grow straight out the center. And that means you don't need to replant a whole spring onion. Here, for instance, is another one. You can see this one's already started to grow out of the center. All I've done is I've left the roots um, in the nutrient solution like so and here is another you can see the center coming out and this is the result after a week or so um, the spring onion completely regrows and way faster than it initially did because it's already got all the roots formed this allows you to keep harvesting the onion and if you want you can just remove the dead tissue and that will grow into your full-size spring onions. You can essentially perpetually harvest spring onion 
in an NFT. Now, the way that I'd probably recommend doing this, because these spring onions are gonna form roots along the channel, um, and you can see the remnants of the Jiffy Peat pellet there. The way that I'd probably recommend doing this is by having a single channel devoted to spring onion so that you can harvest them and they don't get intermingled with other plants. Now, this is the way that I eventually am gonna move this system so that I have my spring onion at the back because they're fairly sparse and they'll let the light through them. And then I have other lettuces and stuff in front of them that I can just harvest as I like. And I've also been getting some incredible pak choy from this system. And this I've just been sharing around with family and friends and neighbors. I've been really enjoying this. It's called Joy Choy and it is. <laughs> the Lazy Man's Gardens are going spectacularly actually. The citrus that I've put in there have responded to being taken care of finally, flowering heavily and I've got new growth tips on all of the places where I trimmed them back uh, when I also potted them. So um, it's spring, it's the perfect time for trimming citrus and I'm super excited for even more fruit. It's loaded with fruit already but more and more fruit. And another self-watering garden that I've set up recently is these cucumbers. Uh, there's pickling cucumbers and Lebanese, but I had a problem. The possums were eating uh, the ones on the end. The one up this end got completely eaten and I had to replace it. So it is a Lebanese cucumber rather than a pickling cucumber. These are just in the auto refill pot sources, each with an individual float valve. And you can see the damage that was done by the possums, but they'll come back. This one wasn't touched at all. So this is kind of where they would all be at if I hadn't had that damage done. And you can see here, I've taken some preventative measures, um, which I took a little bit too late. I did see one of them get eaten and I was like, oh, I hope that doesn't happen to the others. Well, yeah. Um, it did. <laughs> the passion fruit that this permanent trellis is made for is growing really nicely. It's just starting to shoot for spring and I'm excited to see how it handles this whole season. I really want a whole trellis full of passion fruit and cucumbers if I can. Um, that would be lovely just to be able to walk through here and show you the progress. These are the Never Water Again auto refilling pots for larger plants, citrus and whatnot. Now, I'm having some problems with the auto valves, the auto pots. So if I were to recommend building this system, I would definitely aim for the float valves because they're just more reliable. Uh, I am having some nutrient deficiencies with these. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is a nitrogen deficiency, which I have no idea why, because uh, nitrogen is actually the main part of the calcium nitrate. So I'm gonna have to probably do some foliar feeding on these to bring them back up. In the foreground, we've got some more self-watering pots. The garlic is going really well. Now this is the garlic that's in the Wickwear hydroponic system, which was where we had our ginger and turmeric last year. I still have ginger and turmeric, just not as much this year. We've got onions over here, mostly Brussels sprouts and parsley in the float box at the moment. Uh, but behind the float box, we have a massive amount of growth on our dragon fruit. And you can see the difference in growth. All the top fresh green coming up and kind of erupting from the top of the crowns. And you've got the darker old growth coming down off the dragon fruit. So I think we're gonna get a really nice explosion of fruit this year. And I'm really looking forward to that because that was delicious. <laughs> so this is Russian garlic again. Uh, this is not self-watering. So the plants don't look as healthy purely because I have the responsibility of watering them and I am not very responsible at watering them. So I have to come along and uh, hose these uh, with nutrient and they do dry out from time to time. I'm very interested to see the difference between this garlic and the garlic that's in the rain gutter grow system, the wick wedge rain gutter grow system. It'll be an interesting video to see the size differences because they'll plant it at different times as well. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. 
Uh, in the foreground, we have potatoes. Uh, many different styles of bagging potatoes. These are all seed potatoes that I used, and the ones at the back are actually not seed potatoes, they're just store-bought potatoes, and I didn't wash them properly, I don't think. Uh, so one of the types of potatoes just started rotting in the bags, um, and the other started to sprout a little bit. So I have replanted some of the back potatoes. These are Desiree, Desire potatoes. Um, they're a purple potato, and they've sprouted somewhat, uh, and they're coming through in a lot of different places, as you can see. But the chat potatoes that I planted in these sea bags, they did not come through. And they just started rotting. Like, as you can see here, that's the leftovers of a potato. So I replanted these with this, these Desiree potatoes, and you can see that they're already sprouting. I am starting to see the reason that people use seed potatoes and I love, like, the colour on the leaves of these potatoes is just incredible because these are, these are a purple potato. These are the Cherokee purples. And you can see the difference in the colouring, like, between the two types of potatoes. And I've planted a few varieties just to see what gives me a, a good yield. Uh, but I'd say that is also going to be dependent on the potato variety. Uh, but you can see here all of the different bag types. So this is the traditional bag type. Um, these are more of the ginger and turmeric system style of bagging with the slits in them. And here I've just gone for sort of like pirate ship style. It's, it's a bag on its side um, that's just been split down the side. I'm just playing with different techniques to see what the tubers like best. Over here, I've got some capsicums. They're going really well. Um, these were store-bought. In fact, all of them were store-bought because my seeds failed and I went crazy with capsicums. So um, once the seeds failed, I went, oh, I know, I'm not gonna have any capsicums. So um, over here, <laughs> over here are some more capsicums. Uh, uh, some eggplants at the front, uh, we've got some peas, uh, these are watermelons which I'll be planting out into a system, but just tons of capsicum, and in a moment you're going to see some more capsicum, but first I want to show you these, and I'm really excited, I hope that these turn out well. These are sugar cane canes, sugar, sugar cane canes, and because I'm getting so obsessed with fermentation at the moment, I'm hoping that I can start myself a bunch of sugar cane and we can make some delicious, delicious ferments with it. So I'm trying to get sugar cane going uh, and we'll be tackling all of those different ferments over on All The Gear No Idea because not only can we create delicious drinks with sugar cane, uh, but we can also create washes with sugar cane, skipping the sugar wash part altogether for perhaps some future distilling content. If I can jump through the appropriate legal loops, we will see. I'm very excited to do that content, but I'll let you know over on that channel. Okay, so this is uh, my DIY propagation shelving. And it is, as usual, giving me incredible results for my seedlings. These are capsicum that I've been growing from seeds. And you can see my problem with capsicum now uh, because I just have too many of them, <laughs> which isn't a problem. I kind of went nuts when my first lot of capsicum seeds didn't take. And now that they have taken, well, in here, I've got a ton of herbs as well. So we've got thyme, rosemary, basil, oregano, and mint. Uh, up the top here, I've just got some leftovers from the tomatoes and eggplants. A pretty sorry looking leftover tray of the cotton wool technique, which I'll be refilling probably tonight. And down here, we've actually got some indoor plants. So Syngonium mojito, um, and Epiprenium Snow Queen. 
which I've been cloning actually in my plant tissue culture lab. So, and I promise, I promise that this content is coming soon. Um, but as you can see, I am having success cloning some of my plants, especially the Epiprenium Snow Queens. They seem to be loving um, the plant tissue culture medium. I will hopefully have an introductory video to this method very, very soon. In addition to uh, the plant tissue culture, I've been working on this device, which is a plant cloning device with relative success actually. As you can see, we have a ton of roots coming off, <laughs> or, well, most of our plants, except for our capsicum, which I'm not particularly worried about because I have so many of them at the moment. Ow. This is a really good method for drawing roots out. And as you can see, I'm probably gonna have some really nice visuals for you in an upcoming video as well. Because this is mostly herbs. This kind of works with the herbs that I have in my DIY propagation shelving that I'm kind of testing the cloning device against using a media-based uh, rooting so that we can move all of this into something akin to this bagged system where I have basil, mint, rosemary, dill, oregano, thyme, and some spring onion up the end. These have been absolutely thriving in these bagged systems. They've exploded in growth, as you can see, since last time we saw them. And this is all also moving towards preparing my whole garden to start providing different flavors for fermenting and distilling. The idea of moving from a harvest like ginger to a ferment like the ginger beer or something that I'd like to tackle very soon is harvesting cabbages and fermenting sauerkraut and then utilizing the produce of the ferments to then cook with. A two or three step planning process where you plan out your garden to supply the needs of the secondary process like a fermentation or straight cooking which then can move into a third step if you say wanted to take a ferment and distill it or process it into food. That is the general direction that I am now faced with taking the channel and that is tailoring systems to specific plants so that we can get the greatest yield and be able to create some incredible products from the abundance that we can get from our hydroponic gardens. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this update episode of Who Chose. Plenty of exciting systems and videos to explore in the future and plenty of plants to tailor those systems too. Happy hydroponicking and I'll see you next time on Who Chose.